Hello, this is Joe Trahan welcoming you to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, whose mission is to enlighten the world to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances. As the national leader on this subject, they communicate their educational messages through various methods, including this podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to the All Me podcast. My name is Tavis Piatoli, sports dietitian for the Taylor Hooten Foundation, and today I'm going to be your host. Athletes are always looking for a competitive advantage when it comes to their performance. Whether you're trying to reduce muscle soreness, refuel your gas tank, or help your muscles repair and rebuild after an intense lifting session, just making small improvements in these areas can make the next training session a little easier. Are there specific nutritional strategies we can take to speed the recovery process? What would happen if we would consume specific nutrients to improve day-to-day performance and recovery? Would we see an improvement in performance? In this podcast, I'll speak with Kevin Lors, who's the sports dietitian and sports scientist for the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, also referred as GSSI, to discuss what you can do to speed the recovery process from training. We'd also like to thank our partners at Gatorade for sponsoring this podcast. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the All Me podcast today. Travis, great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to catch up. And, you know, today's topic, we're going to talk about nutrition strategies for recovery. I know that's kind of a big word, so we'll define all that and answer a lot of the questions that we have for you. Before we get started in diving into the topic, I always like to talk to our our guest about their career path. I know you've had a really interesting career path, uh, but the first question I kind of want to say is, what got you in the field of sports nutrition and, and how did that lead you to working with the team at GSSI? Quite honestly, I love talking about career paths because no career path is the same. You know, I, I have a unique one myself, and I think it also helps helps out the uh, young aspiring uh, dietitians, you know, and kind of help, helping them on their way, you know, to be able to kind of c- compare and contrast. But basically, uh, you know, uh, a bit of a background is, you know, I, I grew up playing sports um, all through childhood. My mom and dad, they did a pretty good job of, of keeping me busy basically from the time I was four or five, you know, playing, I think my first sport was t-ball up until, you know, I, I entered into to college and I, I played for the University of Nebraska. You know, don't, don't look up any stats on me. You won't find any, but I played, <laughs> I played football for, for uh, the Huskers. And um, uh, during that time, I was, you know, I was, I was struggling to, uh, to gain weight. You know, I came in at probably about 235 pounds and as a defensive end, that's pretty small. Um, and so, you know, they wanted to get me up to about two, 250, 255. So I really uh, started doing my own, my own research and, and reading. And so this kind of got me interested in the field of uh, nutri- nutrition, specifically in sports nutrition. And so as I was you know, basically during the summers when we were training, um, I would uh, train in the morning and then in the afternoon, I would put on my student nutrition hat, if you will. And um, uh, we had an afternoon group, you know, a lot of my teammates would be training in the afternoon. So I would, I would essentially be their, their uh, nutritionist alongside, of course, uh, at the time it was James Harris, uh, who was the, uh, the head sports dietitian at the University of Nebraska. So I got in my, my experience fairly quickly. And then uh, from there, I underwent my dietetic internship in San Antonio at the Baptist Health System, which was primarily uh, clinically, clinically based. Uh, it was more of a, uh, a general, it, it, was, it, was, it was general, but I would say about 80% was about clinical nutrition. And then in 2009, I went back to the University of Nebraska. At this time, uh, Josh Hinks and Lindsey Remmers were uh, both uh, co-leads and and I volunteered for them. Uh, and this was after I had passed the RD exam. And then from there, it was kind of, I, I, I don't believe in luck, but I was sort of at the right place at the right time uh, when I was volunteering uh, with Josh and Lindsay at the University of Nebraska because the Tampa Bay Buccaneers called and they were asking Josh, hey, do you, do you have anybody? And he's like, yeah, I got someone ready to take a job right now. And so when I came on board with the Bucks. Uh, I was both uh, a sports dietitian and an assistant strength coach. And I was probably, quite honestly, I, I was probably 50-50 at first. 
maybe even more so uh, an assistant strength coach. And then as, as the uh, position began to evolve, I became 100% nutrition. And, and I would, I mean, it was, it was one of those things where um, I tried to be everywhere. You know, I, um, I tried to be in the weight room. I tried to be in the locker room, out on the field, training table. I would travel with the team, so on and so forth. That, um, you know, it, it was one of those things where um, it, it, was, it was almost on-the-job training. You know, um, at that time when I came on board in 2010, there was only three of us. So, you know, kudos to uh, Brian Snyder, and, uh, who's with, still with the Broncos now, and, and Joel Totoro at the time was with the, the Patriots, but they, they essentially kind of started the, um, the NFL full-time sports dietitian role. So that was, that was uh, nice to uh, be a part of that. And then from there, uh, just, just basically last year, 2019, uh, I decided it was time for me to move on and pursue um, a different role with, with GSSI as their, their U.S. service lead. So I've been there for almost a year and a half. You know, it's great to hear all the names you mentioned, you know, starting with James and then Josh and Lindsay and Joel and Brian. It's like, wow, I feel like, you know, we're going back and being nostalgic, although we're not old. But, you know, being, <laughs> you know I remember when you were with the Bucks, I was a consultant with the Saints. So it's like, although we didn't see each other in the field, we still kind of competed against each other and the field has grown so much now to where just about every NFL team has a full-time person which it's just amazing to see the evolution of our profession so great to see that path now let's dive into what you do with GSSI what is your day-to-day I know you just kind of started but what's your day-to-day right now look like especially with life in COVID yeah, so again, uh, my primary role is the U.S. service lead. Um, so we have four pillars in GSSI, and that's research, innovation, education, and service. And so um, that fourth pillar of, of service is, is where I, I tend to take the reins. And things like, it primarily, when I say service, I'm, I'm primarily talking about testing, sweat testing uh, in the field, sweat testing in the lab. We also uh, provide what we call needs assessments to organizations, to athletic departments, where we, we go in um, right now because of COVID. We, we do this virtually so where we can go around and, and get eyes on the facility and, and really um, highlight the wins of, of these clubs, these organizations, these, these athletic departments, but maybe even offer some insight of, of what more they could be doing and try to keep that within the sports nutrition and hydration scope. But we can, but we can do that across different departments. You know, not only sports nutrition, obviously, but athletic training, strength and conditioning, sports science, so on and so forth. And then um, we also have a recovery program, which my colleague Bridget Sepena, she is, she's essentially the lead of that. We can do different uh, assessments within that program. You know, such as saliva testing, uh, force plates blood testing with vitamin D, omega-3s, uh, more subjective or, or perceptive assessments, things like sleep. So uh, a lot of things that we can do in the field as well as in the lab, you know, with, uh, you know, lab, lab assessments would, you know, be, you know, typical body composition assessments, RMR, fuel profile, so on and so forth. So I think we're, we're pretty versatile in, in what we can do. And so when I when I first took the job, uh, and this is pre-COVID, it was a thing where I, I, I didn't have a, a whole lot of experience with those assessments other than body composition. And so it was, uh, it was a lot of, you know, on the job training and learning on the run, learning quickly. So uh, amidst COVID, you know, basically since March 13th, uh, when everything hit, uh, I've, been, I've been working from home. So we've really been challenged in the ways that we can provide service to our partners and to our practitioners and to our athletes. And so um, we do offer kits, specifically sweat test kits, that we can send to practitioners to be able to perform these assessments on their own with our assistants. You know, it's, it's, to me, I I wish, I was almost... (laughs) I was almost mad at GSI because I didn't I didn't know about this when I was with the Bucks, but it's fairly new, so I'll give them a break. Um, <laughs> and it's just something to to add to the RD or even the athletic trainer's tool belt. You know, it's it's one of those things where it's like you just make yourself more valuable as a practitioner because you have just one more tool to be able to use with your athletes. And we're kind of so with kits like this, we're continuing to develop uh, right now. 
And um, we're also, you know, just leveraging different, um, different technology and different devices to be able to conduct those, uh, like I said before, those, those needs assessment on site. So that, that's kind of what, you know, what's going on with me in, in terms of, of service. But then, you know, of course, I feel like I've been more busy than pre-COVID, quite honestly. Um, <laughs> you know, it's supporting different projects. Uh, we just had our GSSIU go up on our website on, on um, uh, gssiweb.org. Been, been uh, supporting different webinars. Uh, I had a panel discussion yesterday. Uh, supporting the GX platform, you know, uh, I'm sure everyone's heard of, of GX Sweat Patch that's that's coming out uh, along with the app. And lastly, you know, because our Bradenton lab is down at IMG, which is where I'm based, you know, been been trying to assist IMG with with any of their needs, uh, anything that we can do virtually. So this, I mean, I could I could go on with you know continued research, mentoring, but uh, things are still busy. Still, things are still busy. Yeah, I think people think with COVID, hey, things are just going to slow down and we're not going to have a lot to do. But it seems like it's just like, let's just give them more to do because they're working from home. You know, they can they can focus on getting those daily tasks done. And I definitely, you know, feel yeah. that rap. But good to see that, you know, you've had that career path change. And a lot of times that's really good just to keep our mind focused. Uh, and we've, we're seeing some of the, you know, some of our colleagues make that shift too from professional sports to other professions, which I think is awesome. Let's dive into this topic, recovery. It's a big word, so I'm going to ask a few questions about different components of recovery because, you know, I hear the word, I want to recover faster. And I don't think a lot of people understand what that means and what happens to the body. So my first question, you know, when it comes to recovery, muscle protein breakdown, what is it and what causes it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I kind of like you, Tavis. You know, uh, recovery is such a broad topic, and and so um, it's really just one of those things that has, has caught on, especially within uh, you know the last five or ten years. And so, I think just to break this this subject down is like like we're doing today is is really important. So, pertaining to your question on muscle protein uh, breakdown, I think we we need to like shift and and also focus on the term, you know, protein turnover. So with protein turnover, the body is constantly making protein and breaking down protein. So muscle protein synthesis versus muscle protein breakdown. And so exercise and and training actually increases both of these more so with, with muscle protein breakdown, you know, and so exercise induced muscle damage can actually uh, shift this protein turnover uh, more towards a, a negative protein balance to where we're actually breaking down more protein than we are repairing or, or synthesizing. And so it's, it's one of those things where it's like, if, if, we, can, if we can really enhance and, and shift that, that negative balance over back into a positive uh, protein balance, then that's, that's going to enhance the uh, recovery process. So part one is muscle protein breakdown turnover. We know that's the cause of some things. We'll talk about inflammation in a second. Number two, glycogen depletion. So I, when I look at this, I don't want to kind of say what it is, but you know, I know most people don't realize, hey, this, this is a key component. So first of all, what is glycogen and what causes our body to have lower levels after training? Yeah. So glycogen is basically just carb stores uh, in our bodies. And so uh, we store carbohydrate and, and uh, therefore glycogen in uh, two different places, one in the liver and uh, the other in, in, in our muscles. And so when I refer to uh, or when I talk about glycogen to athletes, I, I, I just return it. I, I, I talk more um, or refer to it more as uh, muscle fuel because our, our muscle uses these stores during training and competition. And, and it's, it's basically our, our primary fuel source uh, during, during activity. The thing about uh, glycogen is that we have limited stores. You know, some, some can store more uh, glycogen than others, but we, we tend to uh, reach, reach a limit at a certain point in training or competition. So these uh, stores will de- uh, deplete over time especially with more intense activity, longer duration bouts. And, and then not only that, you pair that with 
okay, now we're not um, actively restoring those those glycogen stores through carbohydrate ingestion. So that's that's how glycogen is going to deplete over time. And when it depletes, performance will suffer. And do we see, does it matter whether it's an endurance athlete, a football player, any type of power athlete, are they both going to lose a pretty good amount of glycogen, you know, in a long event? I, w- I would say that that depends on training status. It, it depends on like, like we're talking about the type of athlete. Uh, it, it depends on intensity. It, it depends on duration. So I would say, you know, in terms of an endurance athlete, yeah, you know, let's say we're running a marathon, uh, they're going to use up uh, quite a bit of glycogen, but there are some athletes who can tap into those fat stores uh, more readily and, and therefore spare uh, glycogen. And, and so that, that's really important to, to consider is it's, it's not just, you know, a difference of a marathon runner versus a football player, but you also have to consider those, those different variables as well. Let's look at, let's say, the average weekend exerciser or someone who goes to the gym and does an hour in a spin class or maybe a six-minute lifting session. Are they still going to deplete a pretty good bit of glycogen? Yeah, they, they will. And again, I, I think when we're talking about the weekend warrior, if you will, or the, the average Joe and Jane, I, I think, again, it depends on their training status. And, and also when, when talking about uh, resistance training or weightlifting, it also depends on the, the volume of training. You know, if, like I'd say I'm, I'm getting under the squat bar and doing a century workout, you know, 10 sets of 10 or, or even more. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to deplete a lot of my glycogen stores or even doing a, a drop set of, of leg extensions, quite a bit of glycogen is going to be used. And, and same thing with the spin class or, or doing uh, hit workouts in general. Yeah, there is definitely uh, glycogen de- depletion uh, within those, within those activities. Yeah. I know we're going to talk about what to do to recover because I see so many people just like adding protein after and they're not even thinking about carbs. So I want to come back and hit on that. Uh, before we before we get to that, the one last component of recovery, and we can add more, but we've talked about muscle protein breakdown. We've talked about our gas tank being emptied. The third component I want to ask about is inflammation, because I don't think people think about, well, why are my muscles so sore after doing those squats? Like I remember when I was playing high school football, you know, you, you come back in the off season, you do your first day of squats in the next couple of days. You, it's just a funny day to walk. You know, you people looking at you like, why is this guy walking really, really funny? And it's because you can barely get up. Um, so what is inflammation and what causes it? Yeah, that, that's funny that you mentioned that because I, I just think back to, you know, my football days, you know, both, both in high school when, when two days were allowed and, and in college. And I remember thinking in like during off season training, why do I, I hate fall camp and training camp so much? Why do I hate two days so much? Like it just, it was not a fun part of the year. And I think we, we all came to find out, you know, after that first day of, of fall camp or practice and you woke up and you got out of bed, you're like, okay, this is why I don't like it. Cause you're, <laughs> you're in such pain and agony. You, you just, you, you almost forget about the soreness uh, that, that you feel a- after, uh, <laughs> after practice or especially after that first day. And you're like, okay, yeah, you, you remember pretty quickly. So in saying that, you know, <laughs> Again, I, I think inflammation is one of those words that athletes use, but the, yet they don't understand. So it's really, really important to communicate with them and teach them what it actually is. And so inflammation, basically uh, a normal immune response to any threat or quote unquote assault on the body from, you know, varying sources. And, and we, we can talk about different infections, you know, and, you know, bacterial infections, or, or we, can, we can refer to these sort of threats as, as even coming about from exercise, okay? And so it's sort of our, our body's protective mechanism. And so these symptoms of, you know, swelling, redness, um, that pain and soreness that, that we were talking about, you know, both in the joints and in the muscles, those are going to uh, arise from this, this inflammatory process. And, you know, that soreness can arise, you know, anywhere from 24 to, to 48 hours, you know, called delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS. And I think when talking about inflammation, you know, uh, I think small amounts over a short time are good because it's part of our, 
part of our body's uh, adaptive response. But I think what, again, back to an athlete's mindset is, well, if, it's, if a little is good, then more is better. Well, it's not, that's not the case with inflammation because large amounts over a long period of time can be detrimental you know, to performance. It, it, you can, you can uh, increase the likelihood of, of, of you being sick, and ultimately it can lead to injury. And so the uh, key is, is really minimizing the, the chronic inflammation while capitalizing on the acute effects of inflammation, such as adaptation. And so that's, that's going to be really key to recovery. Yeah, that's a great explanation. And I don't, I don't think people realize like muscle soreness is not a bad thing. It's, it's normal. It's going to happen. It, you know, if you're injured, like you said, it's a, it's a totally different response where, Hey, this is a good thing. This is our body responding to what we're doing. Whereas if you're working out and you're not sore, at least the first couple of weeks, probably not working out like you should be, would be my guess. Correct. Yeah, uh, I would say so. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that would, that would probably be correct. <laughs> All right, so let's let's dive into really the key component of this. We want to talk about the nutritional strategies that are going to help people recover a little faster. And I want to try to keep this to where, you know, this is easy for the listener to kind of understand. And I want to make sure I get these questions to where it's, uh, you know, easy to, you know, for you to kind of translate this information. Because I like to, I like to make this so sciencey. That's my problem. Um, let's talk about these nutrients. So if we're going to slow muscle protein breakdown, we talked about, you know, when you work out, Muscles are going to break down. We're going to have inflammation. So carbohydrate first. Does adding carbohydrate to protein after a workout speed recovery, or does it help the muscle repair faster? You know, in talking about carbohydrates, it, it, adding carb and, and protein together, you know, I, I think there's this, this debate on, on whether that's going to help in terms of muscle protein synthesis and help speed recovery. You know, I, I, think, I think it may. And so, but I want to, I want to emphasize that adding carbohydrate and protein together, it, it's going to do more than just increase muscle protein synthesis and enhance recovery, but it's also going to, you know, primarily with, with referring to carbohydrate, it's going to stimulate glycogen resynthesis. Not only that, but anytime you add, you know, you know, carbohydrate or specifically like a higher glycemic carbohydrate, it's going to taste better. So it's going to enhance palatability, but you know, it's not a must. So adding carbohydrate to a, a post-workout uh, protein shake or, or meal, it, it's, it's not, it's not a must, uh, it, you know, because protein alone is, is sufficient to shift that protein turnover into more of a, a, a positive protein balance. You know, I think a lot of people just think, like I said before, protein is the only thing they need. I'm glad you emphasize that importance on carbohydrate uh, just to kind of help that recovery process. Now, one question I've gotten a lot over the years is just how much protein is there uh, that, that, I, that someone would need after a hard workout? Is there a specific amount that someone needs after that lifting session or is it based on their body weight? Yeah, so I think we're, we're starting – uh, we, we, at first, we were talking about you know twenty to forty grams after a workout is sort of uh, of like an umbrella recommendation. But now it, it's we've we've gotten a little bit more personalized with it, and so the recommendation you know post workout is is going to be uh, about 0.25 to 0.3 grams per kilogram of body weight. So if you want to you know like you said, you kind of like to get into more of the you know the sciency and more more detailed parts of it. Tavis, um, we, we can be very specific with that post-workout recommendation. But I think in terms of, you know, more of an acute dose, you know, we also have to remember that it's also about total protein intake throughout the day, right? And so it's important to not only just have that post-workout meal or that post-workout shake, you know, it's, it's also important to uh, consume pr protein throughout the day. So, uh, you know, every, every three to four hours to keep in that positive protein balance. And then with that being said too, you know, we're, we're starting to, you know, dive into more of a, uh, you know, protein before bed and, and, and feedings before bed. And, you know, I, I think I was, you know, when I was in college, it was one of those things where I had, I forced myself to, to like cottage cheese, <laughs> but, but it's one of those, where, where it's one of those things where I just 
plug at first I'd plug, you know, plug my nose and just start uh, scooping it in my mouth. But it was one of those things where I knew that, you know, okay, in order to do what I want to do and gain weight and recover at the same time, you know, that, that, that protein was important. And so specifically, you know, we're, we're looking at casein before bed. And so about 30 to 40 grams of, of casein or more specifically about a half a gram per kilo is, is, uh, is recommended as far as protein before bed, because that casein protein is a slower digesting, uh, slower absorbing protein. So when you are uh, having that overnight fast, uh, you can still, you know, try to maintain that, uh, that positive protein balance and, and minimize the, the, uh, the breakdown. Now, what about for the, I know we talked a lot about strength athletes, anything for the endurance athletes? <laughs> Do they need more or less protein after a long run or a bike or swim or anything like that? Yeah, and I, I think that's a great question because I, I think popular belief is that they don't. But, um, you know, in connecting um, with uh, one of GSSI's protein experts, uh, her name is Sarah Oikawa, she, she had mentioned to me that in all actuality, you know, endurance athletes probably need more protein than than the strength athlete and it's because because of those longer durations and those energy systems uh that they're using is that they're going to tend to tap into an oxidized protein so they'll actually use it for for performance and and during training and competition so you know i you know, say the recommendation for endurance athletes could could be on on the higher end of what we typically recommend um, you know, about two grams per kilo or maybe a, a, a little more uh, versus the strength athlete, which can be between uh, a gram and a half to, to two grams per kilo. Again, but, but it, it also depends too on, on the athlete in, in making those protein recommendations and their, their training status. So I know I keep going back to that, but it's, there's so many variables that, that go into uh, these types of recommendations. This, this is probably a question in regards to what to consume after a workout, because you get a lot of questions on, Hey, should I eat food? Should I drink a shake? And that's kind of my next question is, does it matter what someone consumes after their workout? Like, should they have a protein shake with carbohydrate with like fruit? Should they have a ready to drink or eat a meal? Does it matter as long as they're getting those adequate nutrients in? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think, yeah, so mode, mode doesn't matter as, as much as the, the type of protein. So, you know, yeah, if you want to throw fruit in with your protein shake, if you wanted to consume an actual solid meal uh, or consume an RTD, I, I think that it's kind of um, up to, to personal preference. But I think that, that what you want to make sure is within those, those feedings, uh, you want a high-quality, complete protein that has all of the essential amino acids. And specifically, um, that is rich in the amino acid leucine. So you want to make sure that you're getting about oh two to two to three grams of, of leucine um, in order to optimize recovery and, and, and muscle protein synthesis. And this can come from, you know, whey protein. It can uh, come from uh, more uh, animal derived products or or even dairy. It's a big question. A lot of people are always concerned about what's the ideal. And I get that all the time. What's the best thing? And I'm like, well, there's really no best option. Really what works for you and what you consume at that time. But I think we're always looking for the best option no matter what. Yeah, especially especially elite athletes. You know, they, they, it's, it's all about edges in, in that, that realm and, and at that level. So, you know, it, like I said before, they're of the mindset of if a little is, is good, more is better. And, and what is optimal? What's the best? What, how can I capitalize on recovery? And, and so when you come up with, with answers like, like uh, well, it really just depends. They, they do not like that. But, I mean, it's, it's the truth. So um, it, what it comes down to also in terms of practical application is narrowing down. Like, okay, out of all of the options that are out there, like, one, number one, what, what do you like? You know, what, what are you more apt to be consistent with? Because it's all about, you know, consistency as well as intensity. So if you can't be consistent with something and you're intense on something for a very short, limited amount of time, then, then really it, it's not going to work for you. Yeah, no, no doubt. It's, it's got to be in some cases convenient, but also, like you said, if you don't like it, you can't force somebody, like they don't want to put spinach in their smoothie or they don't want to eat something. It's going to be difficult to keep them compliant. 
let's switch to, we talked about protein recovery. Let's switch to that glycogen recovery. We talked about this is the storage site for carbohydrate. What are the key nutrients that really are required to refill glycogen? Is it only carb or is there, are there anything that can help or can we just focus on carb carbohydrate? I mean, I, I think carbohydrate is, is going to be the primary focus. And, you know, in, in terms of, you know, I, I think we can talk about different types of carbohydrates, but in, in terms of replenish, replenishing glycogen, that glycogen is, is mostly, it, it's going to come from, from the carb, carbohydrate that you ingest. And so, you know, the aim uh, after a workout to help with this glycogen replenishment you know, some, some studies will say, you know, 1 to 1.5, some will say 1 to 1, 1 1.2, some will say 0. 0.6 to, to 1. So, you know, we, we tend to recommend more of that 1 to 1.2 gram per kilogram range, or, or this is roughly about 50 to 70 percent of body weight in pounds. And, and doing this right after the workout and every two hours over the, the next four to six hours in order to, to optimize that, that glycogen replenishment. And, and the reason is why you want to do this uh, right away, and this is kind of where nutrient timing comes in, is because uh, delaying that, that carb ingestion uh, by as much as, oh, two hours uh, can reduce the rate of, of synthesis by about 50%. And again, we're talking about the rate. So that, that's um, when, when we want to optimize that, that replenishment, you know, consuming right after is, is often going to be the best bet for athletes. Does it matter the type of carb? I know we talked about just getting those carbs in. Timing is important, but, you know, after a workout, is it faster better? Do we need faster carbohydrates, higher glycemic carbs? Do they work better for an individual to help them recover faster? Yes, I, I think that the higher glycemic carbs are, are going, to, uh, going to be better and the fact that they're going to elicit a, a higher uh, insulin response and insulin uh, secretion. And, and so, again, you gotta, you kind of almost have to strategize, you know, your feedings and, and think about, okay, when is my next bout of exercise? When is my next training? When is my next competition or game? And so if, if those bouts of, of training or competition are within a short period of time, then, uh, you know, capitalizing on, on those higher glycemic carbohydrate sources are, are going to be better. But you know, let's say, for instance, uh, football players, you know, they, they, they are competing week to week. Um, and so there's probably a less of a reliance on those, those higher glycemic carbs. So you can go more of the lower glycemic carb options to, um, to be able to, to replenish those glycogen stores over time. And, and not only that, but, you know, if there, there is, you know, a, a short period of time between training or between bouts of, of exercise, I should say, sometimes those, those lower glycemic carbs uh, may be less uh, tolerable and, and slower acting because of potential fiber inclusion, fat inclusion, protein inclusion. So um, it, it, it kind of depends on, on the, uh, the next training bout. Can you give me a few examples of what those fast carbs would look like? And I'm curious, like when you were with the Bucks, let's say you got some guys that are I guess halftime or just at certain point of the game, are you giving out certain things to them in regards to what they can do? So first question is fast carbs. What are some good examples of those fast carbs and what have you used with players in the past? We talk about fast carbs, say uh, for instance, you know, if uh, we are trying to increase the, the glycemic index uh, post competition, post activity, you know, uh, more refined carbohydrate sources, such as, you know, white pastas, potatoes, uh, white rice, white bread, bagels, cereals, honey. Those, those are some things that, that I would recommend. Those are some good higher glycemic types of carbs. And then, you know, like, like you had mentioned, uh, let's say um, we need higher glycemic carbohydrates. You know, let's say that at, at halftime, you know, sports drinks, you know, such as Gatorade, chews, gels, uh, those sorts of things that are going to be a little bit higher in sugar. Are, are going to be recommended. And I think this is, this is, you know, one of the great things about sports nutrition. You know, I, I think oftentimes, you know, when we mention sugar, you know, there's that, there's that stigma to, to sugar with the general population and that, you know, sugar is bad. And then this, this tends to carry over into the athlete mindset, you know, that, 
well, sugar's bad. I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be, you know, consuming any sugar because that'll increase inflammation and, and do all these bad things. I'll get diabetes from, from consuming sugar. And it's like, no, 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 that, that's where, you know, you as the RD and the teacher, you know, you have to sort of squash those myths for athletes, you know, because that's, that's what the, the athlete mindset is, is that what works for the general consumer or the, the general public, uh, well, it, it must pertain to me as well. Well, no, you're an elite athlete, you know, or, or uh, you're an athlete in general. And so those, those higher glycemic carbs, you know, the, the, the sugars, are what you're going to use as fuel on the field or, or on the court or in the ring. So really, really important to uh, make that and, and distinguish that from, from athletes to general public. I think people are scared of sugar and I tell them, hey, there's a place for sugar. And if you're going to have it during and after exercise is a great place for your body to utilize that sugar to help you recover faster. And you know, it's exactly. just, the media has created so much fear. Like, oh, if you have sugar, it's everybody looks at every gram. Oh, it's got a gram of sugar. I can't have that. It's like, come on, <laughs> let's have a little fun. You've got to have some flexibility in your life. Let's yeah. shift to that topic of inflammation. We talked about what happens during inflammation uh, after a hard workout. Let's talk about foods or anything that we can do to help that body facilitate. Are there any specific foods you would recommend that may act as an anti-inflammatory agent? Let's say cherries or vegetables, anything specific that you said, hey, these are some good foods that have good nutrients that can help reduce inflammation. So again, like, I, I think it's one of those things too, where I think, I think a lot of, a lot of people just, you know, in the general public and athletes alike, they, they want to know like, well, okay, what are the top 10 foods? What are the top five foods to help with, you know, X, Y, Z, or this, this case to reduce inflammation. And one of the things that, you know, uh, I, I uh, just, preach and preach and preach about throughout the year is inclusion of whole fruits and vegetables in general. I mean, and, and when I do this, I talk about, you know, the benefits, obviously, of fruits and vegetables with, with you know, the vitamins and minerals. And, you know, it's actually, you know, it's, it, it helps also with hydration, you know, and especially with like melons and whatnot. But, but I talk about variety just in food in general and not honing in on one specific particular food item because it's it's kind of like um it's kind of like uh, and i always compare it to an exercise program you know let's say all we're doing is bicep curls in the weight room well we're going to look pretty awkward when we have huge biceps and just the rest of our body is just completely out of whack and out of balance, you know, and, and, and we're sort of like emaciated, you know, uh, compared to our biceps. But so that, that, that focus can create a lack of balance, just like focusing on one particular food uh, or food group um, that, that can create a lack of balance, you know, within our diet. And so with that, that can create certain deficiencies and maybe even toxicities uh, within our blood. And so I really hone in on, you know, just try to consume fruits and vegetables because especially within the, the elite athlete population, you know, and just basic observation for me is, is there's not a, lo a whole lot of athletes that are loading up their plates with, with uh, fresh produce and fruits and vegetables. So varying these sources because they, again, like I said, vitamins, minerals, they have uh, sources of, you know, anti-inflammatories and, and antioxidants as well to help control the, the inflammation to help, you know, some, somewhat reduce muscle soreness and, and also help with recovery. So I focus on fruits and vegetables. And then the other thing too, I also focus on fats and, and good fats, specifically uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And um, so I, I, I'll talk about fatty fish such as salmon and tuna, I won't, you know, go in too far about, you know, EPA and DHA to the athlete, but, but I'll, I'll mention that they have good fats and that will help with, with inflammation as well as, you know, sources or plant sources, you know, such as seeds and, and, and nut butters, you know, from an ALA, ALA component. So that these can help improve not only muscle protein synthesis, but, but may help decrease DOM. So again, just to answer your question, Try to, to really keep it a little bit more broad, focus on variety, specifically produce, and then hone in on that, that good fat component. 
Gatorade is a hydration company. So I want to really kind of shift towards talking about the role hydration plays in recovery because we've talked about muscle breakdown, muscle protein breakdown, glycogen, inflammation. But we haven't really talked about fluid replacement yet. So how does hydration play a role in the recovery process? I think that's a great question and, and something I was going to mention earlier on uh, in the podcast. But I know that we had just put out a, a sports science exchange article. I think it was our 207th article by Dr. Michelle King and Dr. Lindsay Baker. And we're starting to kind of gather up the research on the effects of dehydration in the recovery process. And that dehydration may increase uh, exercise-induced muscle damage and and hinder recovery because of decreased blood flow to, to the tissues and to the muscle, increased osmotic stress, excessive cell swelling, which interrupts with the integrity of the cell, specifically the muscle cell. However, there's, there's, there's few studies, and, and the ones that do exist, uh, they show mixed results. So, you know, more, more research is, is needed in, in that area. But if you have a chance to take a look at that article, it's a really good article, and I think it's starting to hone in on, on an often overlooked part of recovery, which is hydration. And so, uh, you know, in, in going back to, you know, to your question relating to hydration, yes, yeah, since Gatorade is a hydration company, you know, so it could, it could be said that muscle and glycogen resynthesis will be uh, optimized in, in a uh, you hydrated individual because of, because uh, since our blood is our, our basically a transportation system for nutrients and, and, and waste, you know, there's better delivery of these nutrients and, and better removal of these wastes. Is the amount of fluid required based on the duration of training? Let's say they go to the gym for 60 minutes versus a half marathon. Obviously, you know, are they going to need more fluid depending on the longer the duration of the activity? It could be. And, and the thing is, is that I think in order to get a, a more objective measurement of how much uh, fluid you need for recovery is shifting your thinking more along the lines of duration and, and more towards fluid losses. So typically we want to see fluid losses between about a half a percent to two percent of, of body weight. So when we when we exercise, uh, whether you know we we're a football player or we you know we're um, going to the gym, getting a, a pre weight as well as a post weight is going to give us a good indication of how much fluid we need to replenish in order to recovery most optimally. So let's say, for instance, you lose two pounds during your workout, all right? We, we want to make sure we consume 1.2 to 1.3 fluid ounces of, of uh, water for every pound that we lose. So the reason why we tend to go a little bit over uh, in terms of the recommendation is to make up for the continued urine and sweat losses after activity. So this would be about roughly 20 to, to 24 fluid ounces per pound lost. So it's not only just duration, uh, that's, that's prob probably going to dictate how much fluid you lose. And this is primarily in sweat that I'm talking about, but also the intensity, uh, the environment, whether you're indoor, outdoor, if it's hot, if it's humid, that's going to dictate a lot of your, your fluid losses, your clothing, as well as going back to what I, you know, have referred to in the past, you know, with, with training status. So it's these, these variables among others that, that are going to influence, influence this, uh, this fluid loss. So it's really, re really important to rehydrate to get that, that necessary water back into the body so that you can maintain uh, proper delivery uh, of nutrients and removal of those wastes. What about electrolytes? Do they play any role in the recovery process or is that obviously just, is that part of the, the hydration process? So with the sweat, again, every, everyone's different. We're going to have different sweat rates and we're also going to have different sweat sodium concentrations uh, within that fluid. And some, some are uh, pretty salty sweaters. Some might not be as salty as sweater, but the main electrolyte in sweat is, is sodium. Uh, this is the most abundant in, in the sweat. So it's important to to replenish those electrolytes, specifically sodium uh, losses, because this will, and I always tell my players that the, the, the sodium uh, will help the fluid stick, all right? So it's going to help with retention of that water. Otherwise, if you're just consuming water, which 
which is fine. You know, water consumption after after a workout is fine, but pair it also to either uh, something that has some sort of sodium in there, such as uh, Gatorade uh, or or salter foods as well, like during your meals, and and that will will also help with um, that retention of fluid. Let's dive into products. You guys have so many products. I was talking to someone from Gatorade not that long ago, and I was like, wow. The Bolt product, I was, I, I, you know, I don't know why I didn't associate that with Gatorade. I'm like, oh, there's another company with a sports drink. And then I go on the website, I'm like, wait, this is a Gatorade product. So it's so hard to keep up with a lot of the things that you have in development. And my, my, my next question kind of goes into products and what's specific to that need. Let's talk about protein first. We've talked about protein and muscle recovery. Are there any specific products with protein that Gatorade's developed that can help in this area? I've had a lot of experience with with uh, Gatorade products and, and using them as as a practitioner. So one of the uh, products that I, that I used a lot was our Gatorade Recover Protein Shake. It's the RTD, and that's got about 20 grams of protein uh, per RTD, as well as well as that carb benefit of 47 grams of carbs. So this is something again, depending upon your athlete's preferences, this can be something very quick. Uh, it also tastes good because of again that 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 carbohydrate that's included within that. Uh, but there's also whey protein bars, uh, our recover whey whey protein bars, which have 20 grams of protein, 41 grams of carbs. We have a we have an almond butter bar, uh, mm. which is 20 grams of protein. Yeah, mm. it's, it's it's pretty good. And there's three different flavors within that. And so uh, that's going to be a little bit less though than than the whey protein bar. The the the, the whey protein bar is is a is pretty good size. And so the almond bar is going to be about half of the amount of carbohydrate in that bar, but the same amount, that 20 gram amount of protein. And then the other, the other product we have is the, the whey protein powder, which to me, I, I think personally, I think this is probably one of the best tasting proteins out there, if not the best. <laughs> so I, I remember when, when uh, you know, I, I was I was using this with the Bucks, and I still use it with GSSI. Like this is this is all that I use, you know, I, more or less for my snacks. But but the chocolate and, and even the vanilla, um, yeah, they're they're really good good tasting protein. So this will give you 20 grams of protein per scoop, but the carb amount is not going to be as high. So kind of like what we were talking about before, if you wanted to, you know, add some more ingredients you know, such as, um, you know, uh, fruit, if, if you wanted to add honey, you know, specifically, if you wanted to mix chocolate uh, flavor with banana, have at it. Uh, it. It's a great addition. And then lastly, which is a little bit newer, uh, is, is going to be the super shake. Uh, and so this is going to, the reason why it's called a super shake is because it's got a little bit extra protein. So it's, it's got 30 grams versus uh, 20 grams that's in that recovery shake, RTD. Uh, it's got 30 grams of protein, but it's got a little bit less uh, carbohydrate. So you can actually pair this with, with something else that's going to be a little bit you know, higher carb. You, know, you, you can take a super shake and, and pair it with you know, a regular Gatorade product, 20 ounce Gatorade, and you're, and you're going to get uh, a good amount of carbohydrate in with that as well as a, you know, as a high glycemic carb. So those are the Gatorade products. Now we, we've expanded our portfolio and we've included muscle milk products as well. And nice. so I'm not, I'm not going to talk about every, every single product, but I will, I will highlight uh, some of the muscle milk products. And I think everyone, I mean, everyone's so familiar with the muscle milk brand that it was, it was a pretty big acquisition for us and, and just to help expand that, that protein space. So specifically, you know, you have the, the, genu uh, the genuine muscle milk, which is 25 grams of protein, 10 grams of carbs, and, and a little bit of fat. Uh, you have the 100-calorie muscle milk, which is going to be 20 grams of protein, 7 grams of carbs, just to equal, again, that 100-calorie mark. And then you have the Pro Series, which is going to be a little bit higher in protein at 40 grams and 11 uh, grams of carbohydrate. One more thing, Tavis, <laughs> is the Evolve, the Evolve brand, which is going to be more of a plant-based protein, yep. uh, and that's going to have about 20 grams of protein and 18 grams of carbs. And I know I just just basically just shot a lot out to you for, for you and the listeners, but that just kind of goes to, to show you, you know, we're really, really investing uh, in, in the protein space, and, and we really, really believe in it, you know, GSSI and Gatorade as a whole. And because we're, we're expanding more than just, just hydration, you know, uh, that's our bread and but, butter. But now we're really tapping into um, overall sports nutrition and, and, and like we're talking about today, recovery 
and you know the the, the 24 hour athlete yeah, you mentioned that. I mean, I mentioned hydration company. Gatorade has evolved so much into pretty much a complete sports nutrition company with Pepsi's acquisition of Cytosport and Muscle Milk Evolve. You guys have really just expanded all aspects of what you can provide to the athlete, the non-athlete, the, you know, the weekend warrior, a lot of incredible products that you guys have. And it's good to see that. So that kind of answers my last question about what other products and you just kind of went right into that. So I love that option. And you know, we've seen the fact that Muscle Milk has done a great job with a lot of their development, and you kind of cover all phases. Because I, I have a nine-year-old daughter. I, you know, we use whey protein. I make her smoothie some morning. When you're short on time, it's like, all right, whey protein, milk, frozen yeah. milk, some sun butter, because she's allergic to peanuts, so we can't do peanut butter. And it's like, all right, we're out the door. And that's and I the other day I put a handful of spinach in there, and she likes spinach, but she's like, I can taste the spinach, like the little crumbles. I'm like, there's no way. So. It's just, <laughs> It's just kind of funny, but yeah, we try to make some some really healthy smoothies a couple of days a week when we don't have time for breakfast at home. Yeah, be be creative, be creative. I'm all about that creativity. Kevin, this was a lot of incredible information, but before you, before I let you go, I have about three or four what's called curveball questions for you. These are questions that have nothing to do with the podcast or topic. It has everything to do with just some crazy questions I'm going to ask you out of the blue, and it's it's kind of fun because it's like a little lightning round and. It's just to throw you off a little bit, and it's fun stuff that we do with every guest just to see what, you, what you're what you going to answer. So you ready? I, I think so. I'm not good at, at hitting curveballs. So, yeah, I'm going to try to shoot from the hip here. I think these are pretty <laughs> easy, but all right. So I'm a big I'm a big music fan. I like rock music. So a, lot, a question I like to ask every person, just so I can see what they like. If you could be the lead singer of any rock band, who would it be? You know what? I'd have to go Rage Against the Machine. Yes, indeed. I mean, I'm talking about like the ultimate music to like work out to. I mean, really gets you going. So, I, yeah, I'd have to go with, with that because it's a little bit of, you know, in between uh, rock and, and rap, you know, yep. so I, I'm a fan of both. I would say that was probably the first time rock and rap combined. And I was like, wow, what is this in 1991 or 92? And I've been fortunate enough to see them three or four times live. And it's just an incredible live performance. Um, oh, I, I'm, I'm subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Woodstock '99 in New York was probably the most interesting concert with Rage, with just a hundred thousand people going, "Wow, this is insane." Okay. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you went to that. That's awesome. That's <laughs> yeah, awesome. Drop, yeah, it was great. All right, number two, something about you that most people have no idea about, like something unique about you that most people don't know about. <laughs> oh man. There are so many things uh, about me. Like, I would say the most unique. I'm pretty transparent. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty transparent. I just, I know when I, when I answer this question and then I hang up the phone with you, I'm going to just like not like myself because there's going to be something else I wanted to share with you. But <laughs> I think that's a great question. The one thing that comes to my mind and I'm probably going to reg regret this and my wife is going to love this is that I still sleep with my blanket, a.k.a. my blanket. <laughs> I was not expecting that answer at all. No, 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 especially, you know, coming from my background. I, I just, you know, it's one of those things. My, my great-grandmother, she made it for me, and it's just right now is because we have terrible blinds in our bedroom. It's just like a, a nice thing to um, – kind of keep over my eyes, just keep the light out, you know, and, and, and so, uh, you know, especially on the weekends when the sun comes up. So, yeah, I know uh, I'm probably going to get um, a, a lot from the, from the labs on this one, but yeah, just, uh, let's just throw that out there. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll text you or email you if I think of anything else. <laughs> well, my mom's almost 70 and she has this red blanket. It's like almost like Linus from, from Charlie Brown. She's been having this blanket for 50 years and she still, it's funny. She still sleeps with it. It looks like a tiger got a hold of it because there's holes in it. And I'm every time I go to her house, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. You still have it. And she's like, Tavis, I'm going to probably put it in my coffin when I die or whatever. She's like, I just, yeah. it's her security. It's like, it's her, her security blanket. It's like, wow, this thing has been through how, how many, you know, no, no, it's never been through wars, but who knows what it's been through. And I'm like, do you even watch that thing? Like, it, I don't know how you watch <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we won't, we, we, we won't get into that for me, but 
my wife was asking me, he's like, well, are you going to give that to our kids, you know, as a hand-me-down? And, and I'm like, ah, that, that wasn't part of the plan. So I, I'm, it, it might be going in, in my coffin with me as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, last, last curveball question. What is the coolest moment that you've either seen or had while working in professional sports? You know, I don't know if, if I can necessarily pinpoint one moment um, within professional sports. I know, you know, just – I think if I were to even go back in college, and I think you have to kind of realize I'm coming from, from uh, the state of Nebraska, and every kid that grows up in Nebraska, all they want to do is be a Nebraska football player. You know, for me, I had no, no, uh, you know, further aspirate. When I, and again, I was like, you know, probably eight or nine years old. All I wanted to do was, was be a Nebraska football player, and I idolized those guys, you know, specifically the D-Lime and Grant Wistrom, Jared Tomich, the Peter brothers. You know, I, I idolized Tommy Fraser. And, and so that's all that I really could think about uh, as a child. And I remember my first – and I don't know if you have ever seen, the, you know, the tunnel walk, uh, you know, in, in the Memorial Stadium, but it's, it's quite something. And so I remember – my first tunnel walk as a, uh, as a sophomore. And, and uh, I was, I was bawling. <laughs> I was so, I was so hyped up and I was so excited. And I remember, you know, and, and you know, my wife, you know, being my girlfriend at the time and her family and my family, you were able to stand along. Uh, once you came out of the locker room, you were able to stand along the, uh, the uh, pathway going to the field. And I remember I, it, I felt like I could jump 20 feet high in the air. I was just going so crazy coming out of the tunnel. And I remember my, my, my in-laws now were just kind of like, who is this kid? Like, who are you, <laughs> who are you dating? But I would say in terms of an overall like highlight of my career, I would say, you know, coming out of the tunnel uh, for the first time and then seeing the field uh, for, for the first time when, when, when I was a, a sophomore uh, playing against Iowa State. So that was those, those were two cool moments. Yeah, I've, I've been fortunate to visit Nebraska's campus. Lindsay had me come up and speak in 2017 to the football team. And it was just like, wow. I mean, I, I went to LSU. I've been to a lot of places just for, you know, watching games, watching LSU play. But just going to that campus, I was like, I can see why so many people who are passionate about football and just passionate about sports love being in there. Beautiful facility. I mean, just the area is beautiful. So I can see that tradition and, you know, all the stuff that they did in the 90s and in the 80s and success they had, why you could just probably just tear up uh, coming out of that. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Excellent. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Incredible information for our listeners today. And I hope you're doing well and looking forward to catching up soon. David, you know, I just want to say thank you uh, so much for having me on the show uh, and on the podcast. I really, really want to say that I appreciate everything that, that you do for this profession and everything that, that you do for for even just the young aspiring dietitians and even for us vets. Just, just you know, it, it doesn't go unnoticed. I just want to say that. So thanks again. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We're going to have you back on hopefully next year uh, and get you back on the show. Uh, great information, GSSI. We're going to have a lot of show notes for our listeners. So thanks again. We'll see you soon. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading a national campaign to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances and inspiring people to live and compete without the use of these substances. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and tune in to our next episode.